Tonight, our topic is the second coming of Jesus, which is really the purpose of these prophecy meetings. Um, this is the bottom line, right? Being ready for Jesus when he comes again. Is Jesus coming again? If so, when? How long will it be? Uh, we're, we're here to look at those considerations. These are questions that people have asked and continue to ask, not only unbelievers in scorn and derision but also believers ask in faith and hope when's it going to be how long are we going to be here will Jesus ever come and if so um, what's the manner in his coming and that's what we're going to talk about tonight so get yourselves ready I'm going to go fast uh, but hopefully um, we won't lose anybody along the way this is Chichen Itza it's an ancient Mayan city in Yucatan state in Mexico And one thing that's interesting about uh, Chichen Itza is the fact that it is there at all. Because just a few years ago, you remember, um, there were some who looked at the ancient Mayan calendar, right? And said that according to calculations of that ancient calendar, the world was going to come to an end on December 21st, 2012. How many of you remember that? Maybe you were watching your calendar to see what was going to happen on December 21st of that year. It was a big deal. Well, in spite of what was claimed, Chichen Itza is still there today, and the end of the world has not yet occurred. But the end of the world is often discussed, even this year. Um, On January 22, 2017, the so-called doomsday clock... Uh, which is monitored by the board members of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, okay? Uh, This group of scientists has uh, monitored how close the world is to annihilation ever since we first dropped the atomic bomb during the Second World War, okay? And so many times during the year, they have looked at conditions in the world, whether it's war or famine, pestilence, whatever, and they have tinkered with this clock and moved it. Now, it says on the screen, three minutes to midnight. But as of January 22nd of this year, they actually moved it ahead 30 seconds to two and a half minutes to midnight. Okay? Doomsday in their minds representing a man-made apocalypse. They're not religious people at all. These are scientists. But they look at the conditions in the world and they say, you know what? We're very close to annihilation of ourselves, the end of the world as we know it by a man-made apocalypse. Many people look at the, hope, uh, the end of the world with somewhat of a sense of hopelessness and despair, that it's going to all be gloom and doom and calamity. And Christians do sometimes emphasize the calamities that are associated with the end of the world. It's kind of hard to miss those. But I kind of want to get beyond that tonight and help us to focus on really what the end means. Because the end of this world really means a fantastic beginning to the new world. The one in which Jesus Christ reigns in righteousness and peace. And a lot of the things that we have to put up with today are no more. We start with the promise of Jesus in John chapter 14. Probably his most famous promise. Let not your heart be troubled. He said this the night before he was crucified. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, what are many mansions or many rooms. If it were not so, I, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will receive you to myself. That where I am... There you may be also. Okay? This is a profound promise, and Jesus is actually speaking in the language of marriage. It is a marital covenant that is coloring Jesus' language, because in those days, that's how a betrothal would take place. You would come, and after you would pay the bride's price, and become betrothed to the one you're going to marry, the husband, the prospective husband, would actually leave. He would leave the bride with mom and dad there in the house and go off for up to a year. 
And what was he doing during that year? He was literally preparing the home in which he was going to take his bride to and they would live together as man and wife. He would go off and prepare the place they would live. Okay? And then he would come back when the house is finished and then they would have the marriage ceremony, right? And then he would take the bride to their new home. Sometimes there would be a delay. But the bridal party would still be waiting, waiting for the bridegroom to come. So when Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says this, I'm going to prepare a place for you, they know what he's alluding to. He's using that language. He's going away. He's preparing the home where they will, we will dwell together forever. And then he's going to come and take us to be with him. It is a covenant. It is a, it is a promise of a groom to a bride. And they know that. And this is one of the most glorious, profound promises that we have in Scripture. We can be assured of it. The subject is so important that the Word of God refers to it as the blessed hope. Paul uses those words to Titus. Titus 2, 11 to 13, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? When it comes to something as important as the return of Jesus, there's nothing mysterious about what the Bible teaches. The Word of God is plain and clear with regard to Christ's second coming. Just as plain and clear as it was in regards to Christ's first coming. We talked about this last night. There really was no reason to miss the Messiah, when he came the first time, the prophecies were clear. But Jesus didn't live up to their expectations. They wanted something else, and so they weren't ready. The Bible is just as clear about Jesus' second coming, except without the precise timing of it. But there's no reason for us to be confused as to the manner of his coming, how he's going to come back, what that whole thing is going to look like and be like. Okay? It's something that has thrilled the hearts of men and women since time began. When Jesus returns, the last wildfire will have devastated a community. There'll be no more te terrible weather events like we've been experiencing. Jesus will come back and put an end to that kind of tragedy. There will no longer be starving children wondering when they go to bed at night where their next meal is coming from. No more children combing through trash heaps. Jesus will make all things new and it will be done. There will no longer be children going to school or fearing going to school because of guns that somebody's going to show up with a gun. No more tragedies. No more violence and blood flowing in the street. One day it will all be done. No more illnesses. No more disease. No cancer. No heart disease. No diabetes. No strokes. There will be no wheelchairs or crutches or, or, or glasses. No more funerals. No more sorrow. No more goodbyes. All of that will be done with. Amen? Amen. That will be done. No more. Jesus is coming back. And in Revelation 21 verse 4, it says, And God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things. The former things that you and I live with today will be passed away. So when? <laughs> when is he coming back? Well, I'll tell you this. He's coming back soon. Okay, so you want me to be more specific. Okay, let me be more specific. He's coming back very soon. Okay? Jesus is coming back. And we know this. He was clear. But he was also clear that we can't know the exact time when Jesus is coming back. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to get to the question and answer 
period um, after this because I want to discuss with you perhaps reasons why Jesus is not clear on his coming back. Why would there be some vagueness on that point? We'll take a look at that. Some people call this event the rapture. How many of you have heard that terminology? The rapture, the secret rapture, okay? Well, if you look in your Bible, you won't find the word rapture there, just like you won't find the word trinity or the word millennium. But the concept of rapture is there. The word rapture simply means a snatching up or a catching away, okay? Surely, when Jesus comes back, his people will be caught up. That part is scriptural. We'll look at that in just a few moments. His people will be caught up. They will be snatched away. We're going to be going to a better place. I'm looking forward to that. However, will it be secret? Will people suddenly disappear, leaving others behind wondering where they went? That's the part that we want to unpack tonight. 2,500 times, the Bible says, the second coming will happen. But you know what the Bible also says? It also says that most people will not be ready when he comes, just like in the days of Noah, Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And with all those people on earth at the time, how many got into Noah's ark? Eight. And those eight were all members of Noah's family. For 120 years, Noah preached a coming flood and built a rescue vessel that could have taken many, many more people to safety. But at the end of it all, only Noah's family got on board the ark. Compared to the mass of humanity, pitifully few people were ready. And pitifully few will be ready to meet Jesus when he returns. If you think about the significance of the worldwide flood and think about how many people actually heeded the call and were saved, Noah's message was the most important message that could be preached at the time. There was nothing more important than what Noah was preaching. Similarly, as we're on the eve of Jesus' coming again, there's nothing more important and there is no more important message than the message of Jesus' soon coming again, right? And yet we find pitifully few people who are willing to hear that message or to pay any attention to it. With all the noise and confusion and things that are going on in the world, this message, which is the most important for humanity, gets barely a mention, barely a notice. And it's difficult. It's difficult to get people to come and hear about the coming of the Lord. It's a serious warning. But we don't need to make the mistakes of the past. The Bible takes us behind the scenes and gives us some background information that we need to be ready to meet Jesus when he returns. It tells us so much about this anticipated event. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 starts this way. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched talking about the disciples, while they watched, he, Jesus, was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now keep two words in mind, clouds and sight. 
clouds and sight. Keep that in mind. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Okay? This is pretty clear. All right? And notice that the way Jesus went up is the same way he's going to come back. All right? It's just like going to an airport. Now, this would be going to an airport before 9-11, okay? When you could actually go to the gate and watch the plane leave. Okay? You go to the gate. My family used to come to the airport all the time and see me off. And I sometimes could actually see them in the terminal through the glass and try to wave at them from where I was sitting, okay? And you watch the plane, and the plane goes, and it takes off, and your loved one is on board, and you watch it until it's a speck in the sky, and it disappears, gone. All right, so then however long the trip is, three days, a week, whatever, but there's a time when that plane is supposed to come back, right? Family comes back to the airport. Plane comes in the sky, it lands on the ground, the loved one comes off. They came back the way they went. Same thing with Jesus. He went up in a cloud and they saw him go, and the angels said, Look, the way you see him go is the way he's coming back. You saw a cloud, there'll be clouds. You saw him with your eyes, you'll see him with your eyes. Same way, it's not rocket science, it's the same Jesus will also, in like manner as you saw him go, come back again. The return of Jesus is going to be literal. It's a literal event. It will really be Jesus coming back in the flesh just the way that he left when he came back. He's going to return the same way. It's literal, not spiritual. A lot of times people try to spiritualize things in the Bible. They'll say, well, you know, Jesus, he actually did come back in, I don't care what it is, 1935, 1914, 1844. Jesus really did come back. It's just that he came back spiritually. He came back in our hearts. He came back and his spirit is here with us, okay? No, 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 no. The Bible does not say Jesus is coming back spiritually. Spiritually, He's coming back literally. The same way you saw him go is the way he's coming back. He's coming in person, okay? Bible is clear on that. He's coming back literally, all right? What else does it say? Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he's coming with what? Just like he left with. And every what? I will see him just like the eyes of the disciples saw him when he left. Even they who pierced him. Wow, that means there's going to be a resurrection. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The return of Jesus is going to be what? Visible. Eyes. Every eye is going to see him. You're going to see him. It's not going to be a hidden event. Matthew 24, 30 says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Notice, they see him, there are clouds. Sometimes when there's clouds, right, there's other additional atmospheric phenomena. I had some of that atmospheric phenomena happen today when hail came down on my roof, okay? All right, so things, strange things were happening. Matthew 24, 27 says, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Talking about lightning. Can you really miss lightning? Okay, you'll even see lightning in the daytime sometimes. You can even see it with your eyes shut. That's how bright lightning is. There's no way that you're going to miss the coming of Jesus. It will be literal. It will be visible. All right? 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, uh, 4, 16 and 17. Look, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with what? 
a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, that's your rapture, all right? And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, I got to tell you something. Jesus is coming with a shout, with a trumpet, and dead people are coming to life. Let me tell you something. That is going to be noticed. You are not going to be able to sneak that by somebody. That's not going to be a situation where people say, oh, what happened? No, no. I want you to know that when Jesus died, right, the graves were opened. And on resurrection morning, those dear saints were also raised. They were raised for a purpose. Because they were raised as first fruits, but also to counteract the lie that the Roman soldiers were being paid to tell that Jesus' body had been stolen. Okay? Jesus had his own witnesses to bear witness to the resurrection. Dead people. And let me tell you something. You have a dead person come back to life and talk to you and give you a testimony That's a testimony that you're going to hear. All right? That's a pretty compelling situation. Dead people who are now alive. And they were witnesses for those whole 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. Okay? At the end, when Jesus comes again, there is another resurrection. Not just of a few, but of multiplied (laughs) millions of people who have died in the faith of Jesus Christ, they are alive as a living witness that Jesus was telling the truth. And every eye will see both him and them. (laughs) Okay? So it's not going to be something that you can miss. Back in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, where is this place? It's in his father's house. It's in heaven. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm coming back to receive you to myself. Where did he say he was taking us? He's taking us to his father's house. It's as plain as day. Jesus comes back. He calls us up to be with him and to meet him in the clouds. And by the grace of God, we're out of here and we're off to spend time with him in that wonderful place. That passage that we just read could be the noisiest passage of scripture in the entire bible comes back with a shout not a whimper or a whisper and what instrument is he playing a trumpet okay that's a loud instrument jesus is not coming back with the sound of a harp or of a flute he's coming back with the sound of a trumpet and look it's loud enough to wake the dead It's a loud voice, meaning that the return of Jesus will be literal, visible, and audible. You will hear the return of Jesus. But it even gets better than this. Psalms 50 verse 3 says it like this. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Now, underline that. I mean, you've got to pay. He will not keep silent. So there's no such thing as a secret Rapture. He's not keeping quiet. A fire will devour before him and it will be very tempestuous all around him. Do you remember just this week the images of people in Santa Rosa fleeing their homes, sometimes with flames all around them? I'm talking about a fire that was devouring before people as they were fleeing and it was very tempestuous. High winds whipping sparks and flames around them as they fled. It says here that when Jesus comes, a fire will devour before him and it will be very tempestuous all around him. Okay? When Jesus comes back, it will be literal. It will be visible. It will be audible and it will be glorious. What an event this is going to be. The world will see Jesus 
come back. The cosmos will be shaken. And people who waited so long to see their Savior are going to see him come back in power and in majesty. It's an amazing thing to look forward to. And we haven't even looked at the scriptures that talk about him coming with the host of angels. The sky will be filled with angels as well. This is not something you're going to read about online. I remember during the year 2000, remember Y2K? There was a live camera in Jerusalem pointed at um, one of the gates through which Jesus was supposed to come back. And so you could watch it on the computer. I did. I went on the computer and I was looking at this live feed uh, hoping to capture the Messiah on the year 2000 when he would come again. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not going to need to be here at my computer screen looking at a, a surveillance camera to see him. Okay? Every eye is going to see him. And it's not something that you will miss. We don't know the exact time when Jesus will come, but he gave us some signs. And he said, when you see these things, you can know that my return is near. It is even at the door. And he gave us some very serious encouragement. Matthew 24, 42, Jesus said, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this. That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. Now, if you know the hour, the precise time when the thief is coming to your home, right, you watch. You're ready for him, right? You, maybe you have an app on your phone that allows you to look at your house from wherever you are. And if you know what time the thief is coming, you're there waiting. Maybe you've already called the police and maybe they're waiting too for the thieves to show up. You're ready. The passage is speaking to us not about the timing of Jesus' coming, but it's telling us to watch and be ready whenever it is that Jesus returns. Okay? So what's this idea that Jesus is going to come back like a thief in the night? Well, the Bible doesn't exactly say it that way. Look at how it really says it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 for you yourselves know, perfect, know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is what comes as a thief in the night, not Jesus himself, okay? So can you imagine Jesus coming as a thief in the night? Now we know he comes back with a shout and with a trumpet and a resurrection and a fire. Now imagine what kind of thief shows up to your house with a trumpet and with shouting, banging, you know, banging on drums, making his presence known. No, that would be the worst thief in the world. They come silently. But that's not what happens at all. It's not Jesus who comes back like a thief in the night. No, it's the day of the Lord that comes like a thief because for so many people, the day will catch them by surprise. Just like the day of the wildfires this week caught a whole city completely by surprise. They're not ready. The question here is one of readiness. It's a question about the day of the Lord, when it comes. The Bible describes that day in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, again, noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. We need to be on guard, not drifting off to sleep, but alert and awake and ready and watching and prepared to meet Jesus when he comes back. The Bible is very clear that when Jesus comes back, some will be saved and some will be lost. 
Matthew 24, 36 through 42. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay? Then, going on, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you don't, do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Now, this passage right here is where many get their secret rapture. The idea that two men are right in the field, one's taken, one is left. Two women are at the mill, one taken, one is left. The assumption is, is that God is going to secretly whisk away his people. Those are the ones who were taken. And then the ones that are left. Left Behind. There was a whole series of books written by Tim LaHaye called Left Behind Series. They made a movie out of it, okay? And the people who are left behind are saying, huh, wow, I guess those Christians were right. They're gone. Planes crash because there's no pilot at the wheel. Cars crash. Nobody's driving, okay? You've seen those bumper stickers, you know? Watch this car. If, if, if the rapture comes, <laughs> this car will become unmanned. You know? This is where it comes from. But does the Bible say anything about the ones being left alive? Doesn't say anything. And remember this. The context just before this. He says, as it was in the days of who? Noah, okay, so we have to compare what Jesus is teaching now. We have to put the overlay of Noah and the flood on this commentary about one being taken and one being left because we have to now look at that in the light of the flood. In Noah's day, everybody was invited on the ark. A few got on the boat, but most did not. Those on the ark were saved and safe. Those not on the ark were lost, tragically. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two in the field, one taken, one left. Two people with the same advantages, the same situation, the same privileges, the same standing in life. One saved, one lost. Two women working at the mill. What does that mean? It means like you said, in the days of Noah, men were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage. The Lord says, you must occupy till I come. That means we don't have to go off into a mountain retreat somewhere and not work and not, and, and not have jobs or go to school or whatever and just wait in a cave somewhere for Jesus to come. No, he says, occupy. You're going to be working. There's going to be some normalcy of life, okay? Here's the difference. Two people working at the same job, right? They might be working at Boeing. They might be working at Amazon. They might be working anywhere. Two employees working together, same station in life. But when Jesus comes, one is taken, one is left. What does that mean? One was ready, one was not. One had taken advantage of the opportunities to get to know God and to give their life to him. And the other did not take advantage of those same opportunities. Maybe they were too busy. Maybe they didn't believe. Maybe they had other things to do, more important things to do. We don't know the answers. All we know is that just like it was on Noah, in Noah's time, those who were ready got on and were saved. Those who were not were lost. There was no second opportunity once the door was shut. 
you have that opportunity right now to yield your heart to him, to live connected to him, to enjoy the light of his presence moment by moment. That's what we can have. We don't have to look forward to the end of the world with woe and concern. We aren't doomsday clock watchers expecting the world to end just in catastrophe. No, we look forward to the blessed hope. The Bible looks forward and says there is a time of trouble coming such as never was since there was a nation. Now that's true. But do we need to be worried about that? Well, here's something that I want you to know about God. By way of illustration, we'll talk about a historical event, something that actually took place in the book of Daniel, book of Daniel chapter 3. We looked at the story of the image in Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the sweep of history from his time forward, talking about succeeding nations all the way down through to the end. But Nebuchadnezzar ultimately didn't like the interpretation of that dream because it meant that his kingdom would eventually come to an end. So what he decided to do was he decided to build a statue similar to the one that he saw in his dream, and he made it all gold, which meant that the Babylonian Empire would last forever. And he decided that everyone should bow down and worship this image and sent out an edict to that effect. Everyone, when the flutes and the harps and all the music would play, everybody would bow down to this image. Interestingly enough, the stories in Daniel, just about all of them, whether it's this one or the story of Daniel and the lion's den, whether it's Daniel chapter 1 and the test of the food, all of the stories in Daniel have end time implications for those living in the last days. Even this story. And so the day came and the image was erected on the plain of Dura, 90 feet tall. When the music played, everybody bowed down except three people. They stood up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, who were they? We met them in Daniel chapter 1. They were part of the nobility that was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar when Jerusalem was destroyed. These were the wise men. These were the ones who tested more brilliantly than the Babylonian magicians, right? After eating only vegetables and water for 10 days. Same three gentlemen. They were believers in the true God, the God of the Bible, Yahweh. And they were told not to bow down to images. Thou shalt not bow down to graven images. You have no other gods before me. And when the king saw them standing there, he says, hey, guys, what gives? And they were very polite. They said, oh, king, live forever. It's a nice image, but we're not bowing down to it, okay? And we know there's a penalty of death, you know, and our God that we serve is able to protect us, but if not, it's okay. We're still not going to bow down. Well, that infuriated the king. He heated that furnace up seven times hotter than it was supposed to be, even killed the soldiers that threw them in there. And as you know the story... Threw them in, but it didn't burn them up. In fact, there was no smell of smoke on them. Not a hair of their head was singed. And in fact, he threw three in, but he saw four in there. And he said the fourth one looked like the Son of Man. Jesus was in the flames with his faithful ones. His faithful ones stood up for him. He stood up with them. The only thing that was consumed, listen, the only thing that was consumed in the fire were the ropes that bound them together. The only thing that was consumed was Babylonian. Sometimes the Lord allows the heat to be turned up in our lives, sometimes just to burn off what shouldn't be there. The king said, wait. I thought there were three, but now there's four. This is a story indicating that God is able 
to sustain people down here at the end of time. It doesn't mean that Christians are looking for an easy out. In fact, the secret rapture, (laughs) many have accused Christians of trying to go the easy way, right? Because the rapture comes before the tribulation. But there is no precedent in Scripture for that. There's no precedent in Scripture for people being snatched out of harm's way before trouble comes. What you do see time and time again in Scripture is God's deliverance of his people through tribulation, through trial. He's with them. He delivers them. He protects them. But they go through. That's what you see in Scripture. Okay? God is able to protect and shield those who serve him and love him. He's done it before. He'll do it again. You don't have to look forward to the time of the end with doom and gloom. God knows how to protect his people. The big question, though, is are we going to be ready when Jesus comes back? That's a big question. If you and I commute to work, maybe some of you take the sounder. I don't know. But if you take a bus to work and you happen to miss that first bus, it's usually not long before another one will come. You might be late to work, but another bus will come, and you can get it. Unfortunately, there are people who feel the same way about the coming of Jesus. They've been told that if you're not ready when Jesus comes back at the rapture, that's okay, because there'll be another one coming soon. That is, Jesus will come back for certain saved saints. Then some will be left here, and then Jesus will come back for some of them at a later time. Clearly. That is diametrically opposed to what Jesus said with his own lips as it was in the days of Noah. They got on that ark or they didn't. They were saved or they were lost. Two will be in the field, one ready, one not. Two at the mill, one taken, one left. The Bible is plain. The only person really who has an, a stake in you and I believing that it's okay not to be ready when Jesus comes back is Satan himself, the enemy. He's the one who says, be ye therefore ready or not ready. It really doesn't matter. But Jesus said, watch therefore. The enemy of soul says, take your time, kick back. Do your thing. Don't be so so uptight. You've got a second chance. And by the way, every time somebody comes along with another date for the rapture or another date for the end of the world, like they did September 23 and September 30, now they're predicting the end of October. It doesn't matter. Every time somebody does that, what does it do? It hardens the skeptical heart. The people who already don't believe, it just makes them mock right? They hold into the world parties, right? Um, It just hardens them in their rebellion and in their unbelief. As Christians, we need to stop it and just be ready for whenever it is that he comes back. No date setting. You get a second chance. You get a second chance every day you wake up in the morning. When you woke up this morning, that was your second chance. If you woke up this morning and you were not a child of God, if you woke up this morning and you were not surrendered to Jesus, Jesus was saying good news. I'm giving you another opportunity. Giving you another opportunity to get to know me, to love me. When Jesus comes back, there's only, there's only two groups on earth. One group has given their life to Christ, one hasn't. If you read in Revelation chapter 6, there's one group that calls for the rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide us from the face of the Lamb. The other looks up and Isaiah 25, 9 records what they say. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Jesus is coming back soon. He's not going to enter the cosmos silently. When the king of the universe comes to town, the heavens will depart as a scroll. Jesus will come riding down the corridors of space, making an entry into our atmosphere, befitting one who is king of kings and lord of lords. The first time as a babe, humble, in a cave, only shepherds were ready to receive him. 
But this time, he comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. The only variable is you and me. Will we be ready or not? Interesting story. South Africa, I'm going to wind this up. 17 years prior, a baby was stolen out of the arms of its sleeping mother. Then in the spring of 2015, a little girl who was a freshman in high school went to school and all the kids were saying, you look like just one of, like one of the senior students. Well, she looked at that senior and said, my goodness, I do look like her. She told her parents, who arranged for the older girl to come to their home. It was their daughter, their daughter, Zephanie. Zephanie, the girl they had waited for for 17 years. They had never given up hope. They never stopped believing. Her room had been left all those years just as it was when she was taken. Now the family was put back together. It was a great outcome. They waited and they waited. They wondered if it would ever happen, and it happened. My friends, we wait and we wait. Will it ever happen? It will happen. Jesus is waiting. Will it happen? It will happen. Will you be ready? Jesus is giving you that opportunity again tonight by inviting him into your heart, asking him to live his life in you by surrendering to him. You'll be ready to spend eternity with Jesus whenever it is that he comes to take us back. Is it your desire to be ready to meet him when he comes? When he comes visibly, audibly, literally. When he comes in glory. Will you be ready? Let's pray. I pray that we all are. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is clear and plain. No reason for us to be deceived on this point. Any second chance opportunity we have is the one that you're giving to us right now while our hearts are still beating, while our lungs still expand and deflate with oxygen. Right now, while we're in our right minds, when we can make a decision to simply say to you, yes, Jesus, I want to be ready when you come again. If you want to be ready tonight, just raise your hand and just say, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Amen. And I want my loved ones to be ready with me. I don't want to be ready by myself. There's people that I love who I want to be ready as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this word and for this word of preparation. May we take advantage of every opportunity to know you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.